Welcome back everybody to another episode of the Fearless Training Raw Knowledge Podcast with your host as ever, myself, Alex Connor. And I've got something a little left field for you today, to a degree, to a degree. And what I mean by that is I always talk about training, nutrition and lifestyle and I often mention that trifecta, something that is encompassed within what I do within business And as I've spoken about many times, I feel as if the lifestyle factor is the one that is the most neglected. It is the one that is swept under the rug, which is ironic because it's the bigger piece of the puzzle, usually, which has a direct correlation to your success within the realms of training and nutrition and vice versa. They interact with each other. It's not just about filling up one of the cups. You need to create a balance. And my guest this week is none other than the leading female dating expert for men, Kezia Noble. Now, I first found out about Kezia many, many years ago when I was reading about the ever popular The Game. And if you don't know what that is, have a little Google search and enjoy the rabbit hole. However, Kezia is someone who I have found her information to be very direct. That is something she's renowned for. It's very precise. It's very clear and easy to understand. And she talks about a lot of the realities of the dating world, the dynamics between male and female. And I am of the belief that relationships as well as health are some of the key foundations to a happy and long life. And to be honest, I don't think there's enough quality information out there on those topics. And moreover, as always, I'm going to let Kezia do the introductions. This is a phenomenal conversation. It's going to unearth a lot of myths and misconceptions that you may have in your mind. And it might just be the nudge you need to learn a little bit more about this field. It can be humbling, especially for a lot of men out there who feel that they've got this under control but you might be pleasantly surprised. So I have popped all the links in the show notes of which we talk about in the episode. I'm sure you'll have a few thought-provoking questions, so feel free to reach out to myself or Kezia specifically with those questions. And guys, I will mention it. Thank you for all your support. I do appreciate the ratings and the reviews, the likes, the shares, the subscribes. Please, I will ask you once again to do so, or if you've not already, I will ask you to leave a rating and a review if it is safe to do so when you're not driving, as of course it helps the channel grow and get this quality information across to many more people around the globe. All right, without further ado, enjoy my very thought-provoking conversation and very informative one this week with... Kezia Noble. All right, Kezia, welcome to the Fearless Training Raw Knowledge Podcast. Thank you for your time. I believe it is morning time in the UK, London. Is that correct? That's correct. 10.30 a.m. There we go. Hopefully I didn't get you up too early. No, it's okay. I'm quite, I'm quite a, an early bird. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, look, for the listeners who may not be aware, and I'm sure by the intro they've perhaps done some Google searching or they're starting to put some pieces to the puzzle together, give us a bit of a description, a bit of a synopsis of who you are, what you do, and more importantly, why you do it. Okay, so uh, I'm a dating and attraction expert for men. I help guys across the globe uh, get better with women. Um, I work on every aspect of their game, starting from their uh, approach anxiety, working with that, working with uh, their self-confidence, their inner self-confidence, their self-belief, um, opening lines, conversation skills, transitioning points, which means taking it from um, an opening line for an icebreaker to having a full-blown conversation. And then the second transition point would be sexual escalation, seduction, flirting. Um, I've been doing this for over a decade now. I run courses all over the world. Currently, there's some travel restrictions in place. So what we're doing now is uh, online uh, 
sorry, Acceleration Home Training Program, which is great. Uh, it's an online course, and we're still running our seven-day mastery program here in London. Um, but usually we're holding sort of boot camps across the globe. Um, I'm a published author. My book is called The Noble Art of Seducing Women. This is a title that I did not choose. You can blame my publishing publishers for that terrible name. Um, I've had over 75 million views on YouTube, uh, which tells me that there is a huge demand out there for honest female dating advice for men. Fantastic. And there definitely is. And I'm sure we'll start to unpack some of that in this episode. I want to I wanna go back to the start, Kezi. And again, you can streamline this as well for us, if you like, whatever you think is relevant. But how did you get into this position? Like, what did you do? Like, were you working in a bank? Were you an accountant? Were you sort of always doing your own thing? You're very driven, but very business minded. Or is this something that you just sort of stumbled into? I had to take a sip of my coffee. As you know, I am <laughs> very driven, work very hard, as you said, and that's why I need constant coffee. Okay, so how did I start this? So I was essentially headhunted, believe it or not. Um, I was in a bar, and this was in 2006, so we're talking a long time ago now, which is really frightening, isn't it? When you think 2006, is a long time ago. It's like, gone fast, oh. it's gone fast. Yes, and um, this guy approached me and he said that he uh, basically worked for a company that taught guys how to become better with women and that they were looking for girls just to um, give that kind of feedback to the guys in these weekend courses. So the guys would literally practice the material that they got taught on a group of girls and the girls would just give their feedback. And as you know, because we, we kind of know each other, I'm... I'm very much an opportunist. Like I just say yes to things and see where it leads me. I love that. I don't like to overthink things. I'll just say yes and then deal with the, the problem later if I don't like it. So I went, yes, of course, why not? This, this should be fun. And um, there was two things that I noticed when I went to that initial weekend boot camp with this company that I'd never heard of and this industry, this community that I'd never heard of and couldn't still quite get my head around. And the two things I noticed was first, oh my gosh, yes, there are real skills out there that help guys get better with women, um, which I found really interesting. Like, I love social dynamics. Um, I don't like everything to, I like a bit unorthodox kind of um, approaches to psychology and things. And this is what I found was the case here. On the, on the, I thought you couldn't get this from a psych, you know, psychology book. Mm. I, I wouldn't be able to hear a psychologist saying this, I don't think. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be able to see this on mainstream TV. You know when they have like a psychologist come on and he or she talks about relationships? I always think it's bullshit. I don't know why. I always like sit there listening to it thinking, this is just stuff that people kind of want to hear. They know already. There's a few gems there. But when you speak to like people in that industry, the pickup community or the seduction community, it gets really deep. I mean, it's really deep shit. I love it. Anyway, I loved it, and it was like, this is interesting. So this works. And the second thing I noticed is that, that there was no honest female advice. All the other girls were just being nice and saying kind of like what they thought the guy wanted to hear. And I'm like, hold on, this guy's paid X amount of money to hear that, yeah, you should smile more, be more confident, like, you know, Bug off, seriously. So I was just totally honest with them. And then I went to get my coat and I thought I was going to have like everyone charging after me with pitchforks after that. Maybe it was a bit too honest. But actually they were saying, oh, you know, I'd love to work with you. And I remember saying to the boss, like, what do you mean work with me? Like, I don't do this. And he's like, do you want to come work for us? Like that, that quick. I said, oh, you know what, I'll come to some of these boot camps and see how it goes. And um, slowly but surely, I built up like a quite a reputation of giving like very honest advice. And, you know, I was, my advice was getting a lot more, um, I, was, I was able to articulate it better. Um, it was becoming a lot more technical, more detailed, which I really found interesting. So anyway, basically, I had a lot of clients from there. 
I was known to get guys really good results. Like it was, it was kind of, it was kind of word by, is it word by mouth? Word by mouth. I'm using word that of mouth. expression. Of yeah, it. I'm with you. I know what you mean. Word of mouth. Word of mouth. Word of mouth. And um, I, I sort of did um, on the side, which I shouldn't have done apparently, but I opened up my own, I started my own YouTube channel. And I, I started noticing, my God, there's like loads of guys out there that are really interested in this. And they're not guys from this pickup or seduction community. They're just like regular guys out there looking to just get better with women. And what happened is then some, a publishing company um, noticed, you know, I was getting these kind of views and, you know, building this kind of traction and they offered me a publishing deal. So that's the point where I went and opened my own company because I realized that that book was going to get a lot of media attention and I didn't want it to go to the old company. I wanted to go to my company, my new one with my new team, my products. And, um, yeah, and it just grew, it grew and grew. Um, so I'm very pleased with that. So I've tried to streamline that story as much as I can. So I'm sorry if it, it went on a bit. No, I mean, look, this is long form content. So it's, let's get it. We can get as nitty gritty as we like. However, I know we're fairly time sensitive. So I want to get into some big sort of more juicier questions, which I know a lot of men have. And you've touched on a couple of salient points there. And one of them retrospect to the conversation is relationships are extremely important in happiness and wellness in life, but I feel like they're neglected. And you talked about social dynamics. I can relate very, I've always been fascinated, just, you know, people watching, watching the communication. And as you said, a lot of it's all cookie cutter, but when you speak to the real people who have the experience, it's very, very different to what's being advertised. And obviously there's a lot out there for women. Um, there's all this, you know, we went to desire women, this, that, and the other, but there doesn't seem to be much in the way of, information for men to get better it's like you're meant to desire all these women but then women complain about men not being good enough and hence why you have a business right but it seems to to be like a market where you can dominate so to my first question is what are the um, <laughs> i know this is a big question what are the biggest mistakes that you see have seen that men make towards women in relation to attraction and seduction Okay, so um, I'm going to answer this question in a different way, okay? Let's look at the sticking points that most men come to me with. You can divide them into three. Mm -hmm. Approach anxiety, so that means the fear of actually approaching someone, uh, going up and talking to someone. Now, as a result of that approach anxiety, the mistakes that they make is that they come across bad body language when they talk to a girl. It shows nerves, I'm uncertain, I'm not sure. And the woman quickly makes a, a snap decision which says, and fairly or unfairly, let's, let's just shelve that, let's, let's park that about is that fair or is that unfair for maybe another time or later on in the conversation. Let's just talk about what it is, right? And women make a snap decision and say, right, he's not for me, he's weak. Now again, remember, not, it, it might be unfair. Guy's going through a tough time. It took him a lot of courage to speak to that woman in the first place. I get it, I get it, I'm totally on his side. Doesn't matter, the woman's making a snap decision and it's he's too weak, he's too beta, he's not the man for me. Good for him for trying, jog on. So that's the first mistake that lots of guys make, it's that initial impression, that initial, that first impression, as you know, because we've both done an Enneagram test and we're both a three in the Enneagram. People Google it now. Uh, no, after the show. Um, and, <laughs> and you'll know that um, we are big on first impressions as threes. Like it is everything. We've got to nail that first impression, right? And it does, and it pays off in dividends. Mm. It pay, you can make so many mistakes after that. People just have that sort of very shiny, polished first impression of you printed in their head. So that's the first mistake. The second, and we'll bounce like this. So the second um, common sticking point that guys come to me with is running out of things to say. Now this is huge, okay, because it covers such a wide area of, of game. Um, the mistakes guys make in this area, apart from just obviously running out of things to say, is um, expressing themselves 
poorly, inauthentically. Um, some people will overcompensate and present a very fabricated version of themselves. It might be quite aggressive, loud, obnoxious. That's kind of what I do when I'm nervous, but it's a, it's a minority. The majority, what they'll do in that situation of thinking, I really don't know what to say to this girl. She's a complete stranger. We probably have nothing in common. That, that what they'll do is they will usually put on the nice guy filter and they will just be pleasant, be nice. They'll bend their own reality in accordance with hers. Uh, they'll say what they think she wants to hear. They'll nod their head a lot in agreement. Yeah, yeah, they'll, they'll, even, they'll even lie and pretend that, you know, they have the same interests as her. Anything just to, because in their head, the nice guy, the nice guy strategy is I'll get in under the radar. It never works. And that's a big one. So a mistake that men make is expressing themselves inauthentically and apologetically. You want to always be unapologetic for who you are and what you're saying. It doesn't mean you have to be um, obnoxious. Game is all about balance. And I actually had this conversation last night. It was a late night conversation I had with someone. And they were trying to game me a bit. Sort of guy I know. And I was like, you're going to that way. You're not going enough this way. Game is balance. You can be cocky, have banter, do all that. That's great. But balance it out. Be nice also. And I don't mean nice, like, but say something adorable with it. And it's that contrast. I'm going, I'm getting a bit anorak here. I've got to be careful how far I go with this stuff because I do appreciate that some of your listeners and viewers are like just new to this. Like, um, so yeah, conversation skills, building comfort, making her feel relaxed, becoming her number one priority. It's very hard to do if you haven't been taught, if you're not a natural, you haven't been taught the skills. Mm. Um, and the third one, uh, a lot of guys don't know how to escalate. So they often end up in the friend zone. Maybe they can come across quite friendly, quite confident, but they don't know how to spot indicators of interest. They don't know how to interweave flirting uh, techniques into the conversation or to build tension, to build her buying temperature, to ask her on a date. They don't know how to do it. So what happens is, is the conversation remains prosaic, you know, very, um, very sort of uh, platonic, you know, and then what happens is when they actually get to a point where they think I can ask for a number now, it's like that boat's sailed, you know, um, so it's missing opportunities. I think there's so many mistakes that guys make and what I've tried to do is fit them under three categories. Um, one of them that doesn't fit into this category is probably the overall big one, which spreads from the beginning to when you, after you've had sex with a girl to text messages, which is neediness. It's not having that abundancy mindset and just being needy. And women do this and men do it. And it's the hardest thing to disguise because you know when you really like someone, you really like someone, you get needy. It's so normal. It's normal. I've done it, you've done it. We've all been in that position where we really like that person. We thought, I feel weak. I feel fucking weak because I need that person more than they need me. And that's when you really have to camouflage that shit. You have to camouflage it. But also you need to obviously work on the inner kind of side to it also. But it's, it's a combination of both because it's very human. It's, it's perfectly normal to suddenly be needy when you like somebody. And I don't think we should beat ourselves up about that too much. But it's how you play it and how you can manage it. Yeah. And uh, that's my, my speech done. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. You you said a key word there, which I think is really integral to the, to to what the, the points that you made, and that's balance. Yeah. Something that I've learned so far is attraction and seduction is very nuanced. For example, there's a fine line sometimes between two things, and it's it, it's not always obvious. And I think this is where men can go wrong. And I appreciate that there is that is a big question, and there was a lot there that you could have gone into. So thank you for sort of streamlining it and categorizing it. So to dig a little deeper then, or to sort of offset that, what are now sort of the big, biggest misconceptions, for example, that men have that are just not true? I'll use one. Most men or a lot of men that I'll speak to will go, oh, no, I won't approach that woman because she's insert X, bitchy, 
got a boyfriend, something like that, right? And oftentimes these are these narratives that we tell ourselves to make an excuse and not approach a woman. So just an example there, but what are the biggest sort of misconceptions that you experience with you, your coaches, that men perceive that you are able to help break down and abolish so that it's more, that they're more calibrated to go, okay, well, that's not actually the case. What I thought or what has been taught to me through movies and my friends is not actually accurate. Again, getting to some raw, real knowledge of what is actually true with women. Well, um, Taking it from the top, uh, a lot of guys will go and see a beautiful woman or any woman actually, and they'll, they'll immediately put, put up reasons why not to speak to her, such as she might have a boyfriend, she might be a lesbian, she might be in a bad mood, she might be pregnant, you know, anything. <laughs> it's just like anything to put, you know, to procrastinate and not approach. So I, I've, you know, I found that just by using logical reasoning with guys, it's not enough. Like if I just sit there and go, well, you know, what's the worst that can happen? I don't think she's got a boyfriend. You know, look at the way that she's dressed. It, it, this doesn't work. What you need to do is you need to go five steps beyond that and just say, if I know how to talk to anyone, pregnant woman, old woman, uh, married woman, whatever it is, I know how to talk to them. I know how to game. Mm -hmm. then I don't have that fear of the what if. Do you, do you see what I mean? So yeah. it's a bit like when you go back to the conversation schools, I always say to guys, I want, we do role plays with them to show them how to win over a bitchy girl. And the first thing most of them say is, I don't want a bitchy girl. I'm like, that's not the point. That's not the point. You're missing the point. The point is that if you know that you can flip it around with a royal bitchy girl, you will have no fear of approaching women because that's your fear block. That's your, that's kind of like your pain point. If you know that if a girl says to you, sorry, I've got a, I've got a boyfriend and you know what to say in order to flip it around into a positive, then you have no fear. So it's not about sitting there going, you know, let me kind of um, logicalize this. Let me convince myself that, you know, she hasn't got a boyfriend. So what if she does? So what if, if she doesn't like you. So what if she says, fuck off? Imagine if that's her first words to you, fuck off. Well, guess what? We know what to say to a woman that says fuck off to actually make it work. And therefore you start eliminating all the, the reasons to not approach because you've already known how to deal with it. That makes sense. Yeah, no, it does make sense because there's a lot of Again, it's, it's sort of like if you know how to handle yourself or fight or, you know, self-defense, not go out and cause fights, but you're not perhaps as insecure or a little bit more confident because most people, again, are not going to fight you. But if you do get into a fight, you go, well, you know, I'm going to be somewhat okay. Perhaps exactly. that's a metaphor. That's perfect. Like me, like I can't fight. I've never been taught how to fight. I had a couple of lessons in, have you heard of Krav Maga? Oh, I've, yeah, I've heard of it. Apparently very dangerous stuff. My ex-husband was an instructor and so I had he enrolled me in a couple of lessons I just couldn't get it I just was so disjointed or I just I was like don't touch my face don't touch my face in practice so I'm one of those people that will go to the street and I will not pick a fight I will I like I, if, if, if there's anything aggressive I take a massive step away because I'm frightened because I know I don't have the skills to defend myself I really know I don't mm. and I should do and I think that's a really good comparison whereas you can go out and you can kind of, you're comfortable that like if, if something is going down, it, it doesn't intimidate you. Okay, fine. If it's like a really, people have got weapons and stuff, mm. it's, it's a bit different. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, but if you can see like, if there's someone's turning their attention to you, you'll be able to handle yourself a lot better than someone like me who has no clue. And I'm just going to back down and say that just whatever you want, fine. Um, I think that's a really good comparison. I've never looked at it that way. There you go. That's the creativity that goes on in my mind a bit of an insight another key point that i want to get into again because i think this is a really it's a really big topic i know you and i are both really passionate about it i think we share the same view especially listening to some of the content and then also the conversations we've had which is the online dating now obviously the elephant in the room is covid yeah, exactly right for anyone watching you can see but it, i mean the amount of people that, I mean, I'm, I'm very, I'm very opinionated, especially about this, not just that, but people just spending too much time on social media. And 
I, like you, have a, a, very, a very good presence on social media because we have business and we have to. But just yeah, because we to. Yeah, right? But just because we have a presence doesn't mean we're always on there swiping. It's, I see it as you can be a, a consumer or you can be a creator. And I prefer to create, stay in touch with friends for sure, but I'm not there just yeah. constantly being brainwashed. And it seems the same thing is happening in the dating world where – you know, men and women are on there, mostly perhaps men in more of a needy way. And it's taking away, you know, the skill set, but also a lot of the expectation from what dating is about. So give, I know you've probably got a lot to say about this, but give me your two cents on it. Tell me where you think what your, what your opinion is, but also where you think it's going wrong and why. And I know you, you made a really good video about this the other day. Um, I wow. have never used a dating app. Mm. I've also made it very clear that I'm not saying I never use a dating app. I think, you know, we don't know. We don't know. It might be the only way to meet people one day. If, you know, if our governments have their way, that they'd love it. They'd love that. Um, but I won't use them because I think they are not a shortcut. I think they're a massive time waster. And I, I realized this very recently, actually. This was, you know, I always hated dating apps because I just thought, oh my God, no one looks like their pictures. Like, why would you bother? Just, <laughs> the first thing you're going to feel is disappointment. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go on a date going, oh. But I also don't like the idea that we've been put together because this is what the algorithm vomited out that day. It's not very romantic. And people might say I'm a fool for being a bit romantic. Um, but at the end of this little speech I'm going to do, you can tell me who you think's the bigger fool. So a lot of my friends I noticed were going, I'm exhausted with dating. Like they looked exhausted, they looked haggard. And I'm like, dating is amazing. I love dating. I love getting ready for a date. It's so fun. And you know, you just, you just don't know what's gonna happen. And I couldn't understand where this was coming from. And all of them, less so now, um, but I'll talk about that why in a minute. But, they just said, well, it's because we're organizing all these dates with guys and we meet up with them. Sometimes it's like two, three guys in a night. That's really romantic. Uh, and um, they said they're never like their pictures, but they're never like who they, who they portray themselves to be online. So we're just wasting time. And you end up going there and you're in this kind of, this continuum of disappointment. And... I said, ah, oh, that's interesting because they're meant to be a shortcut, these dating apps, but they're leaving you exhausted. Whereas me, I don't ever, I don't, I've been on bad dates, don't get me wrong. But all this, it's kind of like most of them have been good compared to them because I had a real life preview. So if I go on a date with a guy, I've met him at some point. I don't know where, you know, but I met him at some point. I got a general vibe. Um, I got a, a feeling if this is, there's potential there or if there's any kind of attraction. And therefore, when I went on the date with them, I was excited and I'm starting from a positive place. Whereas what they're doing is they're meeting people that they're just sort of second guessing based on a photograph and a couple of well-edited text messages. And when they, as soon as they see each other, it's starting on a low point. And that's very hard to build from because if you're, if you're coming from disappointment, that's difficult to build up from. Whereas I'm coming from a point of excitement on some level. Does that make sense? So my mm, way, even does. though it's a numbers game, numbers game, by the way, everybody, a numbers game is a long process. People think numbers game is shortcut. It's not. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. Me, I'm not wasting time on dates with guys. So people will say, well, you've got less opportunities. No, I have a lot more time to be creative, to work on myself, to work on my business, not wasting time on dates with guys that nine times out of 10 is gonna be a massive disappointment. And the guys that I do go on dates with, the chances are uh, very high that something's gonna happen because I, won't, I wouldn't have wasted my time in the same way. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. There's, um, again, I think if you're gonna do it and for a lot of people out there, it's like, again, it's like social media. If you control it, it's fine. If it controls you, that's where it goes down the swanny, where a lot of people are being controlled by it, right? They're spending way too much time. They got And they're ignoring the girls in front of them. Sorry for interrupting you, but I have been out in bars and clubs 
with guys I know or guys that I can see and they're looking at dating apps and there's beautiful yeah. girls around. I'm like, come on guys, there's women here and you're actually looking at dating apps. Exactly. Well, that, that there is a, a very valid point, but you see that even in sometimes dates, people on dates, you're like, what are you put the fucking phone down? Like again, more for, again, have a line out there. Sure. I've done it. I've used it. It's great. Bit of fun, but it's not the priority. The priority is always, and I've explained this to some female friends who are like, oh no, I think Tinder. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm like, hear me out. I'm like, if you're going to go out on a guy off Tinder, right? I said, you've got this, whatever you've got the lined up date said, if you meet someone in person before that date who ticks the boxes and he asks you out, are you going to go for the Tinder date? Or are you going to go out with that guy? She's like, I'm going to go out with the guy who have Input. I'm like, of course you are because it's better. Like you, you hundred percent know you hundred percent where the guy on Tinder could turn up and you're like, yeah, or the online dating, whatever it is you use, there's not many out there. That's, that's, I, that's I have, what I found. No, no, totally. I mean, I, I can give you another reason why these dating apps are terrible. People are using 10 year old photographs. I know my friends are doing it. Oh yeah, I've, I've been That's on. That's a really dates. good photograph of you. I said, and I'm having half. They go, yeah, it's ten years old. So I said, and this is some guy is doing this, okay. And I said, well, hold on a second, ten years. It's like that's. And he says, well, I've still got my hair. I haven't aged that much. I said, no, I, I agree. You know, it, it, you can see it's you, but it's like it's not you at the same time anymore. And they kind of justify it. I'm like, mm. that's like. 10 years younger and it's just kind of like yeah it's fine I'm like oh, I'd be so disappointed if someone put up pictures like that and they didn't look like that you know I met them but also this is a this is a huge point I want to mention um we've all got a type so when someone contacts us through tinder or whatever these are we're going to just swipe away the guys or the girls and not our type mm. and I think that is such a shame because I, so many of the guys that I've ended up falling for in real life have been guys who are not my type. I looked at them and was like, well, oh, whatever, not my cup of tea. And then something about the banter, the eye contact, the way that they smell, the aftershave that they wear, things like that, the, the, the body language. I would never get that from uh, a one-dimensional photograph. Mm. We're, 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 there's so many times where we are just just going dismissing people that could really be the love of our lives. And I, I mean that I've done this in real life. I have dismissed guys again and again and again, thinking he's not my type. He's not, he's just physically not my type. I can't go for this guy. And this guy has persisted and persisted. And I've, I've gone for him in the end, just based on uh, character. Sometimes that persistence is attractive. Also, if it's done properly, persistence can be very attractive. That's something that a lot of people don't talk about. But it's saying it can be quite arousing for mm. women more than men. Men don't like it as much, but women do. Mm. Yeah, I'll use another good, well, something that I think my audience will relate to. And I always say to people all the time, because in, in our industry, in the coaching world, and the, the health and fitness is the same, right? There's a lot of online trainers, and a lot of them are just, quite frankly, call it what it is, they're shit. And, you know, they've got nice pictures and whatnot, but if you know what to look for, and this is going to springboard me into the next question for you quite succinctly, which is, you know, you can sort of go red flag, red flag, red flag, like you will be able to see with the pickup artists. You'll be like, no, you're not the real deal. And you will never, ever, ever beat the one-on-one -on -one face to face. The exclusive one-on-one -on -one coaching is the creme de la creme. If I'm there with a person, it's the best, right? Versus the online. It's like, yeah, I can still get success with people online, but you'll just never beat that one-on-one. -on -one. And it's the same even more so with dating. Like you will never beat that experience of someone coming up to you and creating that romantic connection. And it was just spontaneous or serendipitous. And like you said, you have that excitement. It's, it's coming from a place which is completely different Whereas I feel like in this over filtered era that we live in, everything has just been sort of diluted too much. And we are just looking for the, I was speaking to some friends this morning, everyone's looking for this next high. But the problem is that we're always sort of on this fix of whether it's caffeine or something like that. Right. And it's to the point where it's like, well, hang on, like maybe we need to kind of get back to some basics here to be able to experience 
what it should be like rather than constantly getting this instant gratification from from social media. And I don't know if you want to comment more before I go. Uh, do you want to add on to that? No, no. I, I think um, I think we're on the same. I think we're seeing from the same hymn sheet here, mm. as they say. Exactly. Exactly. Which but, then oh, leads. I, 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 no, I will add one thing. Oh, go on. <laughs> To all the guys that say, no, it's fine, I'm going to carry on with online dating, thank you very much. I'm not saying stop online dating. I'm saying use it as an extra option, not the only option. And remember, right. remember at some point you are going to have to meet that girl. You're not going to be having online sex with her, unless that's your thing. I'm sure you'd probably rather do it in person. So there's going to have to be this date process. And guess what? You're going to have to have banter and you're going to flirt and make good eye contact and uh don't so don't don't think okay as long as my online game and my online banter is on point i've got her in bed not the case guys you need to work on the real thing also case in point very good well this is and then this is good because there's going to be a lot of curiosity stirring here and i know there'll be a lot of people that are unaware but there'll be a lot of people who are aware of this pickup artist community and the pickup artist community has got a bit of a bad rap over the years and as we've spoke about the game uh, neil strauss all of those things some people will know some people will not google it you'll see some pretty interesting characters what i, wa I want to to for you to go over what the difference is between what the sort of in the box candid sort of not candid sort of canned you know, rigid, uh, be someone you're not pickup artists are doing versus what you do with your coaches, what the, the actual difference is, those fundamentals, and also how to spot, because there's a lot of men out there who may go and have some searches now, or they have searched in the past, they've been robbed of money. How do you identify who the real deal are? Because it's obviously very easy, like in my industry, to appear successful or to have good skills in the desirable service but not be and i imagine that you have a few people that you that perhaps annoy you in the industry because of perhaps mm -hmm. what they're promoting or what they're doing for the men mm, i think it's i think it's got better mm. um there's a lot sorry i'm just going to try and unpack this because there's quite a few questions and conversation points that mm. you made just then and I, I want to try and address all of them. Firstly, um, I actually believe that the old school pickup artists um, have a, had added a lot of value. Um, a lot of people, it's quite now um, popular to say, oh, that stuff's really outdated. There's some stuff in it which is gold. Mm. Um, it's like the sort of universal laws of attraction in there. They're still in there but they're kind of like being muddied by sort of like pickup kind of lines and sort of gimmicky, geeky kind of stuff in it. Um, but they still address universal laws of attraction, which I find really interesting. Like don't be needy. Um, don't be, uh, you know, things like always look like a man of abundance. Don't apologize for what you say. Things like that we, we still teach. Um, I think uh, in the early days of the pickup artist community, there was a, a lot of exaggeration about the quality of women that they got. So there was a lot of forums and they would talk about lay counts and things and their experiences. And I would sit there and think, I don't think that they're quite getting that level of women. And when I, I used to go to LA a lot, where a lot of them were, and I used to see them around the nightclubs and they're like, they weren't picking up women they were not doing well at all. So I think a lot of it was they, were, they had good theory, but they couldn't put it into practice because they hadn't worked on things like the body language and the inner game. And it has to also come together. You need to work on the, the, the inner dialogue, uh, your inner communication. You need to work on that. But you do also need to be out there practicing, working on your skills. And what happens is that sort of feeds into each other. Um, let me explain this. If you say to someone, just be confident and go talk to a girl, and let's say they have a knockback, what that's going to do is it's going to say to them, you're not very confident, right? And then you're, 
you're not as confident as you as you felt. Mm. And what's going to do is going to bring you back down to ground zero again and again. So you've got to do two things. You've got to go in there, work on your mindset, mindset for sure, but also you've got to work on the skills so that you can work together. Okay. And then what happens is when you start building up reference points from your results, that will feed into the confidence. You can't just be confident with no results. I think, you know, it'd be great. It, that's what we're all looking for is to be super confident and not give a flying fuck what other people think and not trying to measure ourselves in this way. But it, we do. That's it. And I think at some point people are going to say, look, where's the evidence? Where are my positive reference points? to justify this confidence that I'm trying to instill in myself. So it works in two ways here. And then what happens is you create the positive feedback loop. That's what we notice with our students is they get into this positive feedback loop. They start, the confidence is building because the reference points are, are getting more positive. And guess what? They're getting more positive because the confidence building, it's feeding in positive feedback loop. And I, all of our students, 100% of our students experience that. Some of them on day one, some of them on day five, but they all, 100% of them experience it. And I think a lot of those pickup artists, what they were doing is they were, they were writing down theory in forums, which were good theories. You know, they explained the theories. Not all of them were good, but they, they really went into a lot of detail, which I liked. But when they went out there, they were just running theories and not working on the, the inner dialogue either. And um, just like, you know, some sort of, they had some social, they weren't socially intelligent really. Um, but I think since then what's happened is um, there's a lot less dating coaches now. They've sort of gone into lifestyle coaching. And I was always said, I was always told you should diversify and go into that. And I'm like, I don't want to because I don't want to water down what I do. What I do is really good. What I do, I do fucking well. I don't want to water it down. Life coaching. I don't know. Where do I begin with life coaching, you know? Um, so I don't think there's actually a lot of pickup artists, dating coaches out there anymore. Not many. Mm -hmm. One or two, three, but not many. Yeah, it seems to have sort of dissipated a lot since when. Yeah, they want to go into life yeah, coaching. They're getting big for their boots. They think, oh, because I can help men pick up women, I know all the secrets of life. Um, what we've noticed is that when we help on our team, guys get better with women, it affects all areas of their life. Mm. When you know that you're good with women, it, it shines through on so many different areas of your life. You're socially more confident. You end up becoming a lot more dynamic at work because being bad with women, not having success with women, is like this dark cloud over you. It's like a financial depression. It's the same thing. It's this horrible thing. It's the back of your head. I'm, I'm not good enough. Women don't like me. And, and a lot of men are ashamed. So what they do is they go to MGTOW and stuff, which hopefully we'll talk about later, which is like, fuck women. Men go their own way, that kind of thing. It's quite mm. big in Australia, by the way, this movement. Exactly. I think that's desperately sad. I know why they're doing it, but it's desperately sad. Um, so that's why I always say to guys, I'm not going to be a life coach because I know that when I help my students get a grip on this key area of their life, it it uh, percolates through to all the other areas of their life rather than just being a life coach mm. that, and, and sort of like um, helping you in every aspect of your life. And then at the end of it, not really helping you with any. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the old uh, maxim of, you know, being a jack of all trades and a master of none. Yes. You, you know, you do need to specialize. Well, if you want to be, if you are good at something and that's what you want to penetrate into, then it's like be, like you said, bloody good at that one thing, then obviously it's nice to be able to communicate in the other areas. But if you've got a business, you've got a niche, right? And then you've got a business that has a demand. What in, well, I'm curious then, Kessie, as well, how do you identify, qualify, and, and uh, find the coaches that you work with? Do you have a certain protocol? Are these people and friends you've just acquired over the years? What's the process you go to, to, to ensure that you're, you're getting these high caliber coaches that are actually the real deal? I want to give away all my secrets. Um, oh, come but on. basically when I first started out, there were actually a few ex students that became my trainers. Mm. They came on the course. They were so good. The, 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 you know, they were like phenomenal. Their development was phenomenal. I always kept their number and I said, you know what? Maybe one day I'm, I'm going to do something. And I always took the ones number that I thought 
were just incredible at doing it, at, at, at their experience. And, and plus they had em empathy with guys who, you know, were, were struggling with women like them. So some of them became my coaches, but they, not all of them, because some of them um, I felt uh, weren't, weren't good. You've got to be a good teacher mm -hmm. and good at meeting women, but not necessarily you've got to have come from a difficult starting point. So some of my instructors are naturals. They've never had a problem with women, but they can unpack their theories and they can, they're, you know, they're, they're not maybe as empathetic as the ones that came from nowhere, but they're really good at what they do. They can show you, look, this is exactly how, what I use to get women. This is, you know, you can take what you want from it and apply it. And it's a natural game, but it is natural game, which has been unpacked. Most naturals don't have a clue what they're doing. They just say, oh, I'm funny and I'm confident. Um, whereas these guys, they can actually go into the nitty gritty, the detail of, of why this works, the philosophy behind it. So my team are a mixture of women also, women that are like me, who are straightforward, direct. Um, they don't give bullshit insights to make you feel good. You know, if they want to... You know, if, if guys like, what do women think of this in bed and they want to do role play with, with the girl and, you know, work on different types of girls, like in the conversation, worst case scenarios, these girls are good. They, they will, when they work for me, I say to them, look, you know, you, you can be kind, you can be sympathetic, all that, of course, but no bullshit, zero bullshit, no lies, no fake lies. You can be diplomatic with how you say things, if that's what the student kind of needs or requires, but no bullshit, no lies. Um, so we have a wide range. Um, we have 21 year olds um, as trainers for the younger guys and some of the older guys love working with 21 year olds. Um, and then we've got um, up to, I think the oldest trainer we have is about 47. Um, and like I said, some are natural, they're all from all over the world. That's the other thing. America, um, gosh, all, I mean, Turkey, uh, we've got a guy from Israel, we've got a guy from France, you know, all over the world. And they, they hear that we're getting really good results for guys and they want to be part of that. So yeah, my, my team are excellent and each one is different. So I always say to my students, take what you want and apply it in a way which is congruent with who you are. And you know, filter out the things that you feel don't work. Yeah, I think that's that's quite critical with coaching as well. Through through any industry, whatever you're trying to teach someone, there'll be certain people, like the knowledge is the knowledge, right? It's like training. The fundamentals will always be the same, and it's the same with attraction. There are some fundamental underlying principles of which you need to abide by. But me saying it, you saying it, someone else saying it, someone's going to connect with it different. Or it might be, I got this from this coach, but then when this coach said this, I picked something else up. Yeah. And no, no one's described it to me that way. I know that's something that I've found in my own coaching experience of, of again, it's language. It's, it's contextual, which I think was uh, something I wanted to mention about what you said before. It's sometimes not what you do, it's how you do it. And that's massive um, in, in all aspects of life that I, I feel in that respect. Was there a question there? No, that was just a oh. statement. But I can carry on with the questions. I thought you might have wanted to add in. Now, no, the no, I, you know, like I said, I, I totally agree with you, yeah. Um, but the, but, the, but just, just to Great go point. back this point I do feel that the big part of of us the reason why we we um, help our students become so successful is that these men get women these mm. aren't the guys that aren't that are just going around with theory they, they they get women and some of them don't get very attractive women they'll say it they'll be like you know my standard of, of women that I get is about six or seven but that that's fine some guys are like that that's you know kind of what i want and some of them can get nines and tens um so it's it's very you know we it's, it's the main point is that it's bullshit free i think there's so many sort of self-help self-development courses out there and i think oh i can just smell the bullshit it's lies it's stuff that you want to tell me so i can spend more money or something i don't know what it is or just to make me feel good um 
but I think it's incredibly important for you when you hand over a lot of money for someone to say to you, look, this is the problem. That's what I say to them. I say, look, this, they, they sometimes come to me, guys, and they're like, oh, I've got a whole list of sticking points. I'm like, that's not your sticking point. A couple of them are, this is your sticking point, and there's a blind spot there. You didn't see it. Oh, and what are your strengths? Oh, they come up with two or three strengths, sometimes just one. Sometimes they just say, I don't have any. And I sit there with them and I show them exactly what all their strengths are and their attributes. And they're like, oh my God, you know, no one's ever told me this. So honesty doesn't have to be cruel. It's having that insight and having that ability to spot very quickly what people have got going for them and what's holding them back. It's a bit like, you know, somebody, I think it's always brilliant, these people who, personal shoppers, stylists, I always find them fascinating. I have no eye for style at all. I wouldn't, I tried to style someone once. It's just, embarrassing so that's why I have like a proper stylist of my he's brilliant he's fantastic this brilliant stylist of my team called Daniel um, and I love the way that they can just look at someone and go this color that this style and the other person's like oh no I only wear black you know I could never wear green or purple and they're like just trust me and then they, they put them in it and they go oh my god I love it it's a bit like that what I do but the diagnosis is, is very much to do with you know their, their sticking points and their strengths um, when it comes to meeting women and attracting women. Yeah, the truth is refreshing and it is a gift uh, to be able to identify very quickly in a certain realm with a certain skill set and be able to point out. And again, it comes with time and experience. You get better at it over time. And yeah, it's a great feeling, I think. To be I've always to been very good at it. I've always been like, that's something I have to say. I'm not a natural at most things, but sort of, Getting, getting to the point, I, that's a three thing also, an Enneagram mm. three thing. That's another thing I do almost, I do the Enneagram because that helps a lot. Mm. Um, but I, I see three things very, very quickly. Um, so I can meet someone and after about 20 minutes, I start s saying things to them. They're like, how do you know that? Because I can tap into their frequency, their default settings very, very, very quickly. And um, I think that for them, it's like a, a big kind of like, weight has been lifted almost like it's like the fog's been lifted also like oh yes i didn't realize this is this is what i've been doing wrong all this time or or this is this is the good part of me that i've been concealing all this time i didn't know anyone could spot it mm. yeah it's like you said it's it's a trait of the threes so it would seem and some people have it some people don't you can hone it i think but yeah, that's why we're all sort of different aren't we we have different skill sets and whatnot but we naturally gravitate towards certain things i want to talk now about then for the listeners what are and again this is again it's specific to each individual so it's going to be difficult to be very sort of nuanced but what are some applications some key takeaways that men can start doing straight away to improve their results of women? I know this is a question. If you had a pound for every time you had this question. But what are some main, like broad strokes, things that are perhaps not so obvious though, Kezia? You know, some things might be right under the nose, but things that a lot of men aren't doing that they could quickly apply to see better results. Oh, wow. A quick things to see better results. I mean, it doesn't have to be quick, but I mean like the broad strokes, the big sort of things that you think, you know what, most guys can do this. Well, because a lot of it is specific, thing, I know. The big thing is that guys run out of things to say, and that's still the big overwhelming worry because they're kind of like, they're seeing past the approach, like, yeah, but what if I approach her and then <laughs> yeah. they run out of things to say. I'd say really work on the conversation skills. Have a couple of lines up your sleeve. And I know a lot of people say, oh, but I don't want to use lines. Just shut up and trust me on this one, okay? <laughs> my argument just don't argue with me on this one point okay I know what I'm talking about here years and years of doing this um, what I mean by lines is not making up shit about yourself mm. but let's um, give an example you meet somebody and you ask them where they're from and they tell you a country where they're from and you just give the same old generic shit that everyone else gives back when they hear where someone's from like oh yeah what part what part of Spain? What are you doing here? Try and just use a simple go-to line when your mind goes blank. That will just save you a lot of time. It will increase 
her her interest in you it will generate more curiosity from her from her half so it just say to her you know what i've never been there tell me two things about it and make it amazing amazing place to visit um you could either say to her um you know what i love traveling it's a big part of who i am i've never been to spain tell me more about it what you've done there is something called springboarding you've acknowledge what they've said, you've brought it back to yourself, you've given some data about yourself, remember a conversation, it's an exchange of data, you've given some data about yourself, and then you've springboarded back to the next question, okay? That's important because a lot of guys say to me they love traveling. I'm like, when do you tell the girl that? And they go, well, she never asked, so you have to springboard. Use the question, use her answer to springboard back to you and springboard back. Okay, another thing is about you, she asks about you, so uh if you're okay she's english you're australian you say good eye i'm from australia yes. <laughs> good eye um do people say good eye still there yeah it, it depends where you would well, depends where you're from in australia yeah. but it's definitely uh yeah it's bantered about yeah okay fine okay i was just curious no that's good we've lost half the australian audience but that's fine no, <laughs> so sorry <laughs> no, I actually was quite entertained by your Australia. That's good. It's like when the Australians try to do my British accent. It's funny. I'm like, go on, have a go. Keep trying. It's good. Some of them do all right, though. So, um, so let's just say, yeah, you're, you're from Australia, and then they go, oh, what's it like then? Most people say the usual bullshit. Oh, it's a beautiful country, really good weather, great surfing, lots of nature, and the other person's in a fucking coma. Trust me. The best thing to just say, if someone asks you where you're from, what's it like? Just say, you know, it's the best place to live and it's the worst place to live. That alone is going to provoke interest. The person's going to say, well, what do you mean? So do you see what I mean? It's little things like this. Just little, tiny, tiny alterations that create a big difference. And most of them are all in the conversation. Um, don't be apologetic for your opinions, for your choices. You can, you can be polite about them. Um, but if she's sort of judgy or she doesn't agree with you, don't back down. Don't back down. This is you. This is your reality. And she doesn't have to love it, but she needs to respect it. Women cannot be attracted to a man that they don't respect. They need to respect them first. On some level, they have to respect them. So that's what you need to get there. She's not, and when I say respect, it's very broad here. It's extremely broad. When I say respect, it means even to the point of, is she respecting you enough to listen to what you have to say in the conversation? Or is she in autopilot mode? It's on you to do something about that. It's not on her, it's on you. Okay, you better have the good conversation skills. You better have good banter. Otherwise, you'll lose your audience. And it's really harsh, I think. I think a lot of guys have to also remember that this is not about what's fair and what's not fair. Do not do that to yourself. I'll give you an example, a personal example to me, and this is not me fishing. I promise you this is not me fishing. But I, you know, I hit the wall probably quite late. I got quite lucky, actually. A lot of people hit the wall, girls, about 25, but I was lucky. I hit the wall about 34. I'm 40 now. Um, and I was like, okay, now I've got a child and everything. I've done all that. I don't, you know, the, the pressure's off a little bit. But I was like, I need to work on other aspects of my personality now. I cannot compete with a 21-year-old girl. There is no way in the looks department I can compete with a hot 22-year-old. She's just going to have better boobs. She's just going to be slimmer. She's just going to have less wrinkles. She's just going to be better. That's it. Okay, there, yes, there are some guys that like the older woman look. I get it, but let's just talk about the majority here. So I thought, there's no point in me getting better. There's no point. Good luck to her. She'll be in my position one day, this girl. She'll have to go through it. But what do I need to do to work on myself? Okay, I need to, you know, I need to become more intelligent. I'm learning another language. I'm reading more now. I need to hold people's interests with um, intelligence. You know, I need to work, I can work on that. Um, yes, I can work on my body and stuff, which I do anyhow. Um, my sex appeal, um, how I move, my confidence, the way I speak. I need to work on all these things to counterbalance the fact that I'm aging and I'm not looking as good as I used to. That's being practical. 
about the situation. That's being practical and clever. So when guys sit there and say, I don't think it's fair, I think women are bitchy for judging us guys, they should give us a chance, fuck off, it's not reality. Just like me getting in younger, it's not reality. Let's try and just work with what we have. Yes, of course, in an ideal world, I shouldn't get old ever, I should always stay 25. And in an ideal world, uh, women should be very nice to every guy that approaches them. Yes, of course they should, but they're not going to be. So it's on you to spin it around, make it work, and create a positive first impression, hold her interest, have a good balance of game, and, uh, and, and build tension. That's, it's all on you. Yeah. No, I mean, that was well summarized as well, and I appreciate the, the raw honesty, true. Because I think that's important. It is what it is. I'm not getting any younger, nor are you. <laughs> no, well, you know, I've lost most of me already, but skin's in, so, you know. <laughs> like you said, it's... You've got, uh, I talk a lot about um, controlling the controllables as well. So obviously I work with a lot of clients who, you know, they want to be, they want to look a certain way and I'm like, look, you see you got Greg Plitt over there or whatever it is they're looking at. I'm like, you're, you might never look like that, but you can look really, really good because you can't change physiology in terms of you can't change the look of your muscles but you can change the size therefore creating the illusion that you change the shape but also i said to them look you can also do that right i'm like you could also clean up your style you get a tan you can do this you, there's a number of things so i think that's a very and i want to sort of underline that because we're so focused on the things we can't control in life it doesn't matter can't control it don't worry about it focus on the things you can control invariably you will start to have a lot more abundance and, and those things domino and you don't need to worry about like the weather and who's saying this and who's doing that. And it just seems like a lot of wasted energy people are getting distracted by. So I, it'll I make feel you like, bitter. pardon? It will, it will make you bitter. Yeah. You keep blaming other people. Like I, I could sit here and blame and say, Oh, fucking Western culture. It makes, you know, young women, um, you know, puts them on a pedestal and women like me, you know, we're kind of like, you know, we're, we're, we're on a scrap heap and I could get really angry. You know what you'll start to see? You'll start seeing my face get bitter mm. and it'll eat me. Um, and there's, it's, it's just, that's why I see it. All these angry feminists, they, they've got this pinched look in it. Yeah. It's, it's, no. it's, it's, like this, it's, this, it's this look. <laughs> and you see my lines when I do that and I think god you know I don't want to become that person sitting there going horrible male dominated society let it go nothing you can fucking do about it just work with what you have and stop being angry you know that pinch look do you know what I'm talking about yeah on feminists? It's just, and it's a hard look and you think gosh you know you could be quite pretty if you weren't so angry in your face <laughs> I know a few of them they're like, they've been sucking on a lemon. I'm like, really? I'm like, uh, so, well, it's like that. What do they call it now? The resting bitch face or something. But I, I see like some of them look truly disturbed and concerned. Like they're so like angry at the world. And I'm like, oh man, you just need a good time or something. I don't know. <laughs> you just need to loosen up a little bit and enjoy yourself. <laughs> so true. The lines, darlings. The lines. Yeah, it's like, they look angry. They look angry. It's scary. It's not good. What, um, <laughs> well, what is on that point? What out of interest, what is the most ridiculous pickup line or thing that as a, a guy has ever said to you on a first encounter? Um, I'm okay. So this is quite interesting here. Okay. This is a personal thing. Um, I think that any pickup line could work. You can make any pickup line work. So if you said, you know, if I could re rearrange the alphabet, I would put <laughs> I next to you. And then the person's about to go, oh my God, please run away. But yeah. you can say, what do you think? You know, you can always make it work. It's the yeah. follow up. That, yeah. You know what I mean? You can say the cheesiest crap. You can love bomb and say, my God, I've never seen anyone as beautiful as you. And everyone say, don't say that to a girl. Never. But it can work. Love bombing can work. You can make yeah. someone, you can sort of, you know, put them in such a spin um, that it can actually work. So I'm, I'm very open-minded about opening lines. Mm. Personally, for me, when you say what's the worst thing you've, been, you've had said, mine haven't been too bad. Um, it, you know, guys, a lot of the time when I was younger, more naive, I think a lot of guys were trying to 
sort of use um, sort of opportunities as an excuse to go on a date with me. Like, yeah, I, you know, I know a modeling agency. I'm, I own, I own shares in the modeling agency and stuff like that. Which like, you know, a bit, but um, what I don't like personally, and if any guy out there is into older women, listen up. Cause I know you're out there. You know why I know you're out there? Because recently I read an article and it showed the two um, most popular search terms on, on porn. The first was lesbians and the second was MILF. I think men have a secret thing. Let's just, they might not say in public, but they like it. So if you want that older woman, flatter her. Mm. I've noticed as I've got older, if a guy starts trying to neg me, N-E-G, which means using kind of sly put downs to mm. get my ego into, you know, to um, sort of restrict my ego, I should say, it won't work. Like, why do I want to be with you? I want to feel good. I want to feel desired and beautiful around you. And I think that that's an older woman thing, slightly. I think with young girls, it's a bit different. But with older women, they want a guy who can make them feel horny, excited, um, desired. So for me, if a guy starts trying to... I don't mind banter and being cheeky. Mm. I love that. Mm. But if, if a guy's trying to sort of make me feel bad in a way, done. I'm, I will bell. I will not wish any bad. I will bell. And I think that... Older women are like that. They don't waste time. The guy is not making them feel good. It's like cancelled. Whereas I think a, a younger girl would be like, she's more fragile. She's more insecure. And it will probably sort of work in their advantage a little bit more. Yeah. No, I can relate. I'm definitely a fan of the older woman. And I like that you can just be very direct and there's no bullshit. They love it. Especially yeah. when it's coming from a younger man. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> well how old do you think i am you have to lie about your age like women do you have to now say i'm 22 kids <laughs> i know right i have to get well you got to get the ratios right otherwise it won't work if i'm too close right no i've, I've actually just turned 29 a couple of weeks ago so oh, uh, you spent in the 20s good Fresh i know meat. yeah right this is this is good news when you're 30 it's all over you've got to play older guy game Ugh. God damn it. Well, I better, I better make the most of these last... Uh, I say you're 25, trust me. Well, I always said uh, 27 is the age. That's it. I'm stopping at 27. That's it. That's prime. I'm good. I'm not counting. Saying that, though, I mean, I know I'm not old, but I did forget. Like it, I knew it was my birthday coming up, and it's, it really did just... I was like, oh, yeah. If it wasn't for my mom and dad, I would have forgot. They were like, oh, you know, birthday, you want to go out for a meal? And I was like... That's right. It's my birthday next week. Christ, how old am I again? But notice how when people say how old, we always say how old are you, right? You go, I'm 29 years old. What about, let's flip it. Like, I know why, but I'm 29 years young, right? Why does it have to be years old? I know we, because we, we're going up sequentially, we're not going down, but I mean, you could just flip it around. Why not? It's just the number. Oh yeah. When I was 29, I would agree with you. But when you get 40, like my age, you, you do feel old. Yeah, no, what I mean is that you could, instead of saying like... I would never say I'm 40 years young. Yeah, you could just, yeah, you know. But the thing is, that could be like a little, like, you know, something funny. Or you just spend, be like, what do you mean? You're like, well, you know, I feel like I'm 20. <laughs> or whatever it is that you are, but... I think you're okay. I think, yeah, do yeah. that when you're 29. I think it starts getting, like, very, very cringe when it's in the mid-30s. Yeah, well, it's like the... Well, you've got to own your age. You've got to own your age. So many, like, I actually put a picture of me on Twitter the other day, and I said 40th, you know, 40th birthday, and I put, like, hashtag vintage, something like that. And everyone starts saying, you're just lying about your age. You're just trying to get attention. You're not 40. You're about, you know, 30-something. I'm like, so I'm literally the first woman who is lying about her age, making herself older, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Most women... I never understood women who lie about their age and go, oh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm 32 and they're 40. I'm like, but everyone's going to say you, don't, you look old for 32. I don't get it. I think I get it when you're about 70. Then you don't want people to know you're 70. Then I might start saying I'm 55. Yeah, but the thing is, you're not going to know, are you? It's like, like you said, just own it. Whatever it is, just own it. Be like, I might start adding on a few years. I might start telling people I'm 48. Yeah, you have a real shock. There's, there's certain <gasps> ages that you get to where you could be any do you know what i mean it's like once people sort of get over 20 a lot of people could be anywhere from 20 to 30 
You know what I mean? Like they've got to look. And then there's certain checkpoints where you're like, no, you can't be to a degree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Funny story. Sure. Um, well, Kezia, before, before we go, because um, I appreciate you being generous with your time, as always, and I know the conversations are always very thought-provoking. Um, first of all, what's next for you? Do you have any exciting endeavors on the horizon? Anything that you can share? Do you want to just keep expanding your coaching? Have you got any new books, podcasts, anything coming out that's new? What is, what is on the horizon for Kezia? Where do you, where's the direction? Okay, so we are currently running um, the Acceleration Home Training Program. That was initially just for kind of like the sort of lockdown period. We just put it up there and a lot of people liked it. But then we realized that a lot of people were doing it regardless of lockdown. It was just a lot more convenient for them to do online. They couldn't get to London. It's Mm. more cost effective. So we're going to be doing a lot more of that. Podcast, I am giving it a rest. I know a lot of people, I had a podcast, I did it for two years and it did really well on iTunes and loads of people have said, look, we really, really want more podcast episodes. And I love doing the podcast, but really we are so busy now with the Acceleration Home Training Program and we're very busy with the Seven Day Mastery Program here in London that I don't have the time to, to commit myself to, as I was doing before, fortnightly episodes mm. at best i would get one every six weeks out and it just for me it just it wouldn't it, it would be no point so yeah the acceleration home training program the seven day master program is what we're really focusing in on right now yeah no fantastic and we'll look at those um i'll get you to share those links in a moment but before i do something that i like to do with all my guests before i leave is there's one oh, no 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 not not favorite something or oh God. no 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 no. I was gonna. I have a final question, but um, no, I have rapid fire questions, which are just fun, fun things. Oh God! Of, okay, let me just turn up the volume for this. Uncover your personality a little bit, and they just sort of show you humanity, you like if you like. And um, so the first one is, and it's really simple. Uh, and don't overthink it; just whatever comes to mind. If you could choose a superpower, what would it be, and why? <laughs> Oh, uh, oh, oh, um, I would like to be able to, you know, be, be like a gypsy or, or one of those kind of um, people that could just go like that and something bad would happen to that person, like a magician. Do you mean like a witch? Someone like this to me, they fuck with me, I just go, I'm going to turn into a frog. That. Yeah, Who I think that's a witch <laughs> or a sorcerer. Jesus. Yeah, All right. a witch. All right. Fair enough. That's, that's cool. I, I, all right. Fair enough. Um, it's, I think this one's appropriate for COVID. I know you've just been on a holiday, but if you could wake up anywhere in the world tomorrow, where would it be and why? Iran. No, I'm joking. <laughs> hey, I've heard good things about Iran. People get it confused with Iraq. I've not been, but... I don't want to be... Wait, I don't want to wake up. Sorry to any of my... I have Iranians that work for me. So I was just going to say... <laughs> Uh, where would I wake up? Uh, it would be somewhere. I'd like to wake up. This is going to sound corny as fuck, but a Greek island. Yeah, no, but that's, yeah, I can see why. It's picturesque and it's beautiful. 100%. And if you could have anyone at dinner, you can pick a couple of people, dead or alive, you could have a conversation yeah. with, who would you choose? Grace Jones. Um, Richard Burton, Oliver Reed. How many more people have I got? I think those. Um, There's a top three, but I mean, if you've got any that Simon come to Callow, mind, I know a lot of people don't know who Simon Callow is, but he was always on my dinner guest list. Um, and I'll pick one more person. Um, it would be. I think I'd need another woman because Grace Jones is pretty alpha. Do I want another woman? No, probably not. I don't know. It'd probably be someone. It, it, I want someone from the Bible, but then I don't want to be lectured. And that's what I'm worried about. Like, I want someone from the Bible because I'm like, look, I've got to ask you some questions. Just like, can we just sit in the corner, please, here? And you can just tell me if this stuff is real or not. It's very, very important. But then I think, like, after I've asked that question, they're going to be sort of sitting there at this 
dinner table with these drunks and it's going to be a bit uncomfortable. I'll just stick to those, those three. I'd be very fine with those three, four. Yeah, that'd be good. It'd be like a little house party get together. It'd be good. No, no, I think just sensible drinks and cigarettes and cigars. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Very proper. Brandies and cigars by the fireplace. And my final question, which I ask all my guests, a bit more serious in nature. They're, they're just a bit of fun. Which is, can you identify a fear in your life that you've had? It can be small, can be big, something like public speaking. Try not to use that one. <laughs> what the fear was and what you learned from overcoming it, or if it's something that you're still trying to overcome. I have fears that I'm not prepared to discuss on anyone's podcast, even my podcast. They're very personal to me. There's some fears. Um, it's a shame I can't talk about the public speaking one because I really did overcome that one. But hmm, fears, fears. <sighs> Jesus. So that's a, it is a serious question because there are fears which I just accept. Like I have a fear, for instance, of wasps. Like it's it's dreadful fear. Like I will scream and run out of the house if there's a wasp in the house and I will have to call someone up to, to, to take care of it. Um, then I think, well, I can't be bothered to overcome that because it's, it's really not a big deal. Um, but the fears that have really hold me back, I think I've overcome them just from being forced into the situations almost like making that decision of saying if you don't overcome that fear you're never going to get to this next stage um and just sort of weighing up with it like for instance the wasp thing like if i don't overcome that fear of wasp i don't think my life's going to be that much different you know um i'll be a bit more relaxed maybe at barbecues that's like about it um but with the other big things in my life i, I think the big one was I think the big one was getting divorced and being on my own after being with someone for so long. That was very hard with a young child to do. That took a lot of courage and uh, it, it took a lot of time to overcome that sort of fear of being alone for a while mm. and not having someone to, to lean on. That was very difficult. But I had to look at the bigger picture, which is I, I'm, I will be happier in the long run as a result. So, yeah, is, that is quite um, a deep question. Is it that is. the right answer? There's no right or wrong for that one. It's, it is. It's a, it's a bit of a um, – it kind of throws a lot of people at the end because we go from something not quite lighthearted to quite deep. But, again, it, it can be anything, and it's always whatever you're comfortable discussing. And the reason why I'm really passionate about fear is, obviously, my business, Fearless Training, is it seems to be the biggest thing that holds us back in life, right? We've all got fears – and you can know you can use these fancy acronyms, false well, expectations. Fears, which is not important. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of them are I mean, because it's something that's generally it's not physical, right? Fear is time feeds fear. It's in our own head. It's when we had uh, nightmares as kids it was you know if you've had them it's the illusion your mind is so powerful and a lot of the time if you can break down and rationalize those fears and take steps like you you said sometimes you're forced into them and you overcome them or you're motivated by fear so sometimes we have goal setting we have fear setting and it can just be a really powerful tool and i think by speaking the guests that i'm able to speak with like yourself it it can sometimes offer a lot of insight because people might be listening and go well i've i'm sort of that's where i'm coming from and it might just be something that you say or someone else says and that can be the protagonist for them to start overcoming their fears and i think if we if we lived in a more fearless world it would be quite a quite an extraordinary place not that it isn't already but and boy do we live in a fearful world right now i mean god almighty yeah yeah. I know you see what it does. It's oh, I know we said before we wouldn't go to politics, but it's really opened my mind to how easy you can scare people, how frightened people really are out there. <sighs> you know. Yeah, there's how, a lot of. How, how did we cope with the World War? You know, how did you know? How did people cope with the Second World War? I know in Australia it's different, but in England it was really fucking bad, and people just seemed less frightened than now. I, I, I think 
I think it's all the education. I don't trust these schools, how we've been, you know, we don't have critical thinking anymore. We just kind of, we, we become gobblers. I call them gobble up, gobble up uh, mainstream news, gobble up everything that authorities say, just gobble it up. Don't question it, just gobble it up. Don't think for yourself, don't ask, don't use your feelings, don't use your heart. Just use what, you know, just listen to what the BBC says and just do as you're told. Don't ask any questions. I think it's, I, I'm, more, I'm more frightened of the fear in people than any pandemic right now. Mm. It's the fear that I'm frightened of because that fear is making people go absolutely loop the fucking loop. Yeah, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. I mean, the best, oh, I talk about this a lot. And again, we're on the same page. The best thing you can do is stop watching TV and consuming all that bullshit. That's what. It, I mean, I use the yeah, analogy of... I go out and I see someone in a, gar- in, in a park with a visor, <laughs> a fucking... But this person must have a mental illness, I think. Wow. If you have, like, one, you, one tiny particle of a brain cell, you'll know that that's not going to help you. you. You just, like... It's almost like the most basic thing, and yet people are wearing these things, and I think... God, it's like you've, you've probably gone to university. Mm. You know, you've probably gone to school. You know, you've had to use your brain in life. What's happened to it? And it's fear. And you're yeah. right. Fear makes people insane. Exactly. And common sense is not common anymore. <laughs> <laughs> all, all health and safety now, isn't it? I think. It's just gobble. Let's gobble up what the BBC BBC. Let's see what the BBC tells us and, and the who. Yeah. 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 Very reliable. Read, read up about them. How many things, uh, how many mistakes they've made. But let's just gobble it up. Don't question. Just gobble, gobble, gobble. Yeah. It's very much like that. And it's. I'm sure there's a lot of people that listen to your podcast who are probably think that I'm talking an absolute load of bullshit. And do you know what? Maybe I am. Maybe I'm the wrong one. Maybe there is something there and I should be working myself up about it and I should be dressed like. You know, I'm going to a nuclear power plant, you know, when I go to the shops. Maybe I should. And I'm the idiot here. Um, and I, I'm prepared to swallow that. I'm prepared to say that I'm not 100%. But I just, just my gut feeling, which I'm told I'm not allowed to use anymore because your gut feeling's really bad, you know. You've got to use this. But my gut feeling plus my just general common sense tells me that um, this is a big, massive overreaction yeah look i think i mean it's it's, it's, no it's it's a challenging one to unpack because i think again it is again it's contextual it's serious there are things there but at the same time there's a lot of misconceptions there's a lot of fear mongering people just doing stupid stuff and it just gets out of control and it's australia have you got those plastic perspex visors in australia too I, I've not seen them that bad in Australia. The, the, the continental thing. Yeah, no, I've, I think I've seen one, a couple of, of something, I don't know, in the UK. And I've seen the full, and I was like, wow. Like, we've got in certain stores, you know, they've got like, generally you do have it in England anyway. You sort of have your glass there, or they put these sort yeah. of perspex glass up. The, 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 the most significant one i've seen is a french restaurant in a shopping center near us and they've just sort of got these like it's like a little one that kind yeah, of that, that mouth yes and it, you can see the spit on it and everything yes it's actually quite it's disgusting stupid. it looks so stupid it looks worse because i'm like oh you need to clean that <laughs> <laughs> anyway write that down we Hey, tell you what, we put the world to rights, me and you. We need to solve some problems. Maybe we should start a political party. Let's vote in. Banned. It'll be banned. Yeah, it would be. We'd just be the fearless lot or something, and they'd be like, "Oh, common sense, ban them." (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) don't. Well, that's the thing, though, isn't it? If you're seen to be dispelling the truth these days, you try and get hammered and anyway anyway um kezia for for the audience who and i'm sure you've perhaps wet their appetite a little bit now with with some of the things that you've said and some of the conversations we've had where are the best places for them to find more about you what you've done your book your podcast your resources the mastery course the acceleration course etc plug away just just go to the mothership kezia-noble.com Everything's there. I'm not one of these people go, 
check out my Twitter, my Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, because none of you will remember it. All the links are in there, kezia-noble.com. My social media accounts are all linked there. My telephone number's there if you want to talk and discuss a little bit more about what options are best for you. Um, and more information about my, my courses, podcasts, everything is at the mothership. Fantastic. I mean, you could have been an Instagram influencer overnight there, but you, you know, fair enough. The mothership, no. Everything one stop. Noble 18. Kezia Noble 18. Is it? You've not got a, um, an OnlyFans, have you? <laughs> oh. I've been asked to do this. Quite a few people have asked me to do an OnlyFans. What is, what, I mean, no, let's not. Let's not. Let's not get into that. But, um, yeah, that is the world we um, live in. Kezia, I appreciate it. I will put uh, the link to your website in you. the show notes below. I might put a link to the podcast as well because I think there's a lot of valuable information. I know, like you said, you're not... Um... Sorry, go on. Thank you for inviting me to your show. I really enjoyed doing it. Some great questions there. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. No, absolutely my pleasure, Kezia. Thank you uh, again as well. It's something that uh well, it's a conversation i've wanted to have for a while you've been on my guest list and obviously i've read your book many many years ago so it's um yeah it's quite sentimental to finally have a conversation and again share some knowledge so i appreciate your time and thank you for perhaps uncovering some misconceptions and slaying some common myths in this space thank you all right, guys. Well, thank you all for listening. As always, if it's safe to do so and you're not driving, remember to leave a rating and a review. I've got to say it. If you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, yes, and subscribe. And of course, until next week, in the meantime, stay fearless.